The pace of change has never been this fast, yet it will never be this slow again. As technology continues its meteoric rise into the workplace, the workforce around it must adapt and embrace it. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Ravi Kumar, the President and Deputy Chief Operating Officer of Infosys, discusses the importance of how we can reshape our education system by adopting lifelong learning techniques and how the hiring process will shift in the future. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com platform. This podcast is created by the team at mission.org. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at mission.org. And we have on the other line, Ravi, what's going on? Hi, Ian. Good to hear from you. And uh, thanks for hosting me today. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. We are super excited to get into your background. We're going to talk about reskilling workers and the future of work and what that might look like. Um, And then we're going to be talking about all things Infosys. So before we get into all that, how did you get started in technology in the first place? So Ian, you know, I didn't start my career in technology. I have a very diverse background. I started as a nuclear scientist. Then I moved on to uh, do management consulting in PricewaterhouseCoopers. Then I worked with Oracle selling software. Then I kind of worked for a consulting firm called Cambridge Technology Partners uh, on CRM. And that was my connection to come into Infosys, uh, where I started with CRM consulting. Then I actually ran the Oracle business. Then I ran manufacturing industry group, then insurance and healthcare. So very diverse portfolios I've managed. Uh, I have to say that um, I like working in very uncomfortable zones. I'm kind of one of those individuals who wants to try new things. Infosys has been this uh, extraordinary platform which gave me this opportunity to try new things, work across very diverse geographies. Of the 17 years at Infosys, I worked 12 in uh, in India, and then I've been in New York for the last five years. And so tell me a little bit about your role as president. So, um, Ian, I manage um, all service lines across the firm. So the way we are structured is we are federated in the markets. And we are consolidated uh, uh, on services. So all the services across the world roll up to me from uh, consulting, technology, infrastructure to business process management. Uh, The last two years I've been uh, involved in uh, creating significant transformational opportunities for the firm. And uh, it was a two-way thing, transforming client landscapes, but also transforming Uh, what Infosys is all about uh, so that we could actually cater to our clients much better. So that's been my journey. I've been in New York because we were transitioning into a talent model, uh, which historically was a hub and spoke with large offshoring uh, uh, centers in India. And we ran, we almost evangelized the global delivery model. But uh, I would say in the last uh, two plus years, we have been transitioning into an agile distributed talent model and we're building these local talent hubs, which get amplified by the human, uh, by the by the global human capital we otherwise are good at. And so, you know, our show, we talk to a lot of CIOs um, and CTOs and CDOs about digital transformation. We talk about the future of work. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts about you know the future of work and upskilling? Um, where where are we kind of all headed a little bit from a high level? Yeah, so the future of work has been um, very interesting in the last um, few uh, years. Um, I would say the last twelve months, because there has been a confluence of uh, forces which are changing uh, how work is going to be in the future, and that in turn is changing how workplaces would be and how workforce would be. Uh, And I'm probably going to say maybe four or five important things which uh, determine the future of work. First, I think work is moving from a paradigm of 
private human capital, as I call it, where employers employ a set of dedicated employees, and I call them private human capital. And, and it's moving to a three-tier private plus public plus machines, uh, private human capital being full-time employees in your organization, uh, public human capital being a gig economy, which gives you the scale and agility and uh, the ability to ramp up and ramp down, which is kind of what enterprises want to, if you want to compete with uh, digitally born firms. And then uh, the third being machines. So uh, machines, you know, progressively taking over problem solving while, uh, while humans progressively moving towards creative problem finding jobs. So the shift from private human capital to public plus uh, gig plus machines is a, uh, is a big shift because humans in work uh, will be expected to find problems while machines will solve problems, which to me is a fascinating change in the way you look at uh, work. The second second thing which um, which is a big shift is uh, uh, everybody is expected to be a lifelong learner. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, the industries are so rapidly changing. Uh, digital technologies are uh, disrupting what work packets would be and uh, what workplaces would be that um, you want to, you have to move from a paradigm of uh, of an era where we we learned first and then we got deployed into jobs to an era where you will have to learn all your life and you have to be a lifelong learner so if you want to be successful in in the future you have to learn to learn, learn to unlearn, and learn to relearn. What education should do is to just make you a lifelong learner. So if you are a lifelong learner, then you would at ease learn to learn, learn to unlearn, and learn to relearn. And, uh, you know, I just wrote this very interesting article in, the, in, the, in Knowledge at Wharton, which just got released yesterday, about how the future of learning is going to change. And it's going to change from just in case to just in time. Uh, all of us learned in our lives as um, individuals who would read and learn everything just in case something is required in your life. Uh, and we're going to switch from that paradigm to a just-in-time paradigm, which means uh, you are a lifelong learner and um, you have to ab- absorb everything which comes to you and then apply to the job. And you might have to do three or four jobs in your professional life because uh, humans are living longer. I love that. That's a great Justin from Justin, uh, just in case to just in time. That's great. Absolutely. And that to me is a, is a big switch and um, academic institutions, large corporations, everybody has to get up for that. So that's the second big shift, I would say, from, um, from, from a perspective of future of work. The third, third big shift is opportunities are going to be democratized in a, in a digital age. In the past, Technology actually created a divide between STEM and non-STEM talent. Uh, there was so much opportunity for STEM talent, but the digital age will democratize that opportunity, and you're going to move to this paradigm of um, having many more non-STEM jobs in uh, at work, which is primarily work related to finding problems more than solving problems, as I mentioned. So that would mean you need uh, more people to do liberal arts, small people from a background of liberal arts, people with a background of design. And more importantly, if, if I may uh, be provocative, uh, you might actually have more people coming from community colleges into, uh, into work because no longer degrees are going to get you work. What will get you work is skills and uh, stackable degrees because you have to be on a lifelong learning continuum. So the ability to switch from degrees to skills, I think is a, it's an apt time to do that. And I would say work would be much more democratized and work would be much more inclusive to go beyond STEM and to actually reach out to associate degrees and people who don't have degrees and people who have skills and who have learnability. You know, that's the big thing which um, I'm kind of very uh, excited about. Learnability as a trait for people at work will be tested much more because you will have to change at rapid pace and uh, learnability will drive how much you can change, how much you could unlearn and how much you could relearn. 
So these are a bunch of shifts, I would say. Work is going to uh, evolve and uh, expectations at work is going to be very, very different. Yeah, I completely agree. And there's a lot to unpack there. I'll start with, do you feel like companies should be a upskilling entity? Like, do you feel like, you know, we we have a lot of, uh, you know, leaders that come on the show that are really focused on driving innovation that are trying to, you know, do things like, you know, whether it's like low code development or, you know, turning people that are in accounting into developers uh, for a moment and then and then back and forth or whatever it is, um, developing capacity that might not have traditionally been there. Like, what is the role of the company or the leadership team to upskill employees? That's a very, very important question you asked. And um, I think it's going to define how firms uh, address the problem of uh, human capital in a digital age. In the past, reskilling was not a such not a big agenda for large enterprises. Uh, but if you want to digitize yourself into a future which is secure, you have to repurpose your human capital. And repurposing and reskilling is such a big endeavor that it is no longer the responsibility of the individuals, but it is the responsibility of the enterprises or the employer and the employee to come together for, for reskilling. Uh, and I was actually talking to some of my friends in, in, in academic institutions, and I was telling them how they will have to gear up from a B2C world to a B2B world. Uh, universities today cater to students who come and work for them. Uh, ed tech companies like uh, Coursera, Udacity, they actually work for students who come and reskill themselves. But uh, reskilling is such a big initiative. It's a, such a big thing for the future that employers will have to play a very important role in leading it. And employees will, of course, have to be a part of that uh, ecosystem. So employees and employers have to come together for the purpose of reskilling. And, um, and it will be the single biggest reason or constraint why organizations will not be able to will not be able to digitize themselves or why they would be able to digitize themselves. To me, the entire academic ecosystem has to get up from a B2C world to a B2B world if uh, we have to do the heavy lifting needed for large enterprises to stay relevant in an in a age where digitally native firms are, uh, uh, are disrupting them. Uh, I have this fascinating conversation with policymakers, policymakers in the government, uh, about what their role in reskilling is. I realized that um, governments who are wired to cater to citizens in the first 20 years of citizens' lives and the last 20 to 25 years of citizens' lives, uh, governments have to now wire themselves to the middle and not to the start and the end. And the end of a, you know, not at the start, at the end of a uh, life cycle of a citizen. Uh, and government infrastructure has to gear up for that. So governments now are more keen on workforce development and workforce uh, workforce uh, reskilling. Uh, I happen to be a part of the Governor's Workforce Council in the state of Connecticut, um, and I'm so so fascinated about that role and the role of the government. So I would say the role of the government, the role of large enterprises, employees, they all have to come together for this um, huge task of reskilling. Uh, if these enterprises have to stay relevant. Well, I think that part of the challenge there is that the signal in the market is look at what, you know, aggregate jobs are open. You know, if you were to take, you know, all of LinkedIn or whatever it is, you say, okay, well, you know, there's half a million backend developer jobs that are available right now at any given time. So we know where the shortage is in America you know, at any given time of developers. But that is actually kind of like a trailing metric, right? It's not a leading metric because it's saying that, you know, in some ways, obviously, we know we need to develop capacity there. But that was, you know, those wrecks kind of have come because of the need for those jobs. That's not like a forward looking metric. That's not saying that like, you know, 
those type of things are are in the future. And one of the ways that you know I think is super fascinating, um, if you look at like Salesforce, and obviously they're the amazing sponsor of the show and we love them. But if you look at like their commitment to Salesforce admins, this was something that 20 years ago nobody needed a Salesforce admin. And then now, you know, because of the su- success of their company, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of of Salesforce admins are needed all the time. And so they built you know, their, their trailblazer platform and all of those things. I, I think it's a great example of this is a job that nobody saw coming, nobody could have seen coming. And yet they answered, you know, the bell cow there as quick as possible in a way that is, you know, efficient. I mean, who knows what the future of that looks like, but that's a particular thing that there's no way a government or even the classroom could catch up to that type of innovation. Like there's just, it's, there's no way to predict it. I'm curious, like, how do you think that, you know, is it worth it for companies to develop those type of things? So, Ian, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, I think you're, you're spot on. You know, if I take the uh, December jobs report, which came out in January, it's roughly about 145,000 jobs, which uh, got incrementally added in, in the month of December. Uh, however, IT, the IT jobs added into that list is much, much lower than what we expected. I tech jobs and IT jobs in, in that list, a large chunk of them were retail jobs which got added. Uh, and, and by the way, as you rightly pointed out, there are 400,000 open positions if you just go, go into any of the portals and look for in the US. So it's counterintuitive that you have 400,000 open, 400, open jobs, but there aren't enough people who could get to those jobs. You know, uh, just that emphasis to just tee up this this question you just mentioned, we have a culture of education and learning. And uh, back in 2017, we mentioned in we made an announcement in May of 2017. If you have seen uh, seen that um, uh, news, we said we're going to do 10,000 jobs. And the first question which came to me from everybody is, how are you, where are you going to find these people? And we said, look, we are not a company which wants to trade jobs in the market. You know, what people, what large enterprises do today is they go into the market and try to find ready-made individuals who are available to do their jobs. Now, most enterprises are doing, doing this, and that's the real problem. The ability to find what the future looks like and run finishing school infrastructure, which helps you to build capabilities which don't exist today, build rather than trade talent. And that was what our value proposition was. So what we then did was we built academic partnerships. We invested in training. We, we invested on $20,000 for every new hire from schools and colleges. And we hired from schools and colleges to get to that 10,000 job, 10,000 number in two years. So very few corporations today are willing to invest on finishing school infrastructure, as I call it, and the ability to uh, invest up front eight to 12 weeks of you know, training, which makes them production ready, which makes uh, you know, school graduates production ready. Go to non-traditional talent pools, like uh, I did mention to you about going to liberal arts schools, going to design schools, and, and more importantly, going to community colleges. That gave us the runway and the headroom to find talent which doesn't exist today. So hiring from the market is not good enough. Mm. Building talent based on potential and learnability is how you build a pipe for digital talent. And that is the approach we took, and it kind of reaped the benefits and the, and the rewards we got out of it. And now we've created an engine for, for training, hiring, and deploying talent into our projects. And we have now got to that point where we think this is a sustainable experiment. And uh, we are now building a corporate training university in Indianapolis. It's going to be the largest tech corporate training university in the United States. And we're going to go live with our first phase in uh, in December 2020. And as I went through this experiment, Ian, I realized this whole process of building human capital for yourself was one objective. But our clients started telling us, look, we need this more than you. So we think we can not only lend a human capital for transformational journeys as a consulting firm, but we can also lend that value chain to them. And lending that value chain means we have, we should be in a position to lend our infrastructure, our training infrastructure, our capability building infrastructure. So this the corporate, you know, education center we are setting up 
will not only help us, but it will help us to reskill and uh, and build talent pools for clients who want to build their own tech workforce as much as they want to outsource a part of it to us. So that's the that's the magic wand you know enterprises have to apply on. They just can't go and hire from the market. They have to hire alternate talent pools. They have to go and look for adjacencies and and uh, invest on reskilling from adjacencies. And then of course they have to. Uh, look for talent from schools and colleges to build this. And interestingly, we built we built six hubs in the U.S. We went to places where there isn't any tech talent immediately available. We went to places where there are academic institutions uh, which can partner with us to build those talent pools. So we went to very unusual places to build tech talent. We went to Hartford, Connecticut. We went to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Indianapolis in in the state of Indiana, Richardson in Texas. Raleigh in North Carolina and Rhode Island for design talent with the Rhode Island School of Design. So it's kind of a very unusual pick, but then it worked because we were going to places where uh, there, there is a potential opportunity to build those talent pools from colleges. So when you were talking to the other leaders in the company about doing this and you're saying, we're going to invest blank amount of dollars, you know, I would imagine that that could potentially be a tough conversation for for other leaders um, because you're saying, "Hey, we're investing this much, and we're getting how many sales out of this? How do you how do you kind of like make that case? How do you look at you know framing the problem and framing the question that this is something that's necessary for the company to do?" So, so that's a great question. Actually, you're 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 actually spot on um, to hire talent readily available in the market. Uh, is a very natural way of looking at your talent needs. To build talent pools and then invest on training up front and then using that as an opportunity to create talent at scale is a very untraditional way of doing it. But then as we were transitioning from tech services to digital services, a lot of those services were consumed in closer proximity to our clients. So while we built this engine, this extraordinary engine of uh, talent in, uh, back in India, we have the largest corporate training university in the world in India. We realized that we could take that same principles and build something locally in the United States, which is our, one of, which is our biggest market. And uh, we have to bet on ourselves because we could train upfront, invest these dollars, and subsequently, what might potentially happen is uh, we might lose them. We might lose them even before we can monetize on it. But that's what you have to bet on. You have to take these bold bets of saying, um, you know, they will, the people who we hire, uh, who get trained with us, will like us and will like the work they will do, and hence they will hang in with us. So we took that bet. It is a, it is a unusual bet. Uh, but we, you know, in the roots of this company. Learning and education is kind of uh, very deep into it. So it wasn't as difficult to say that it, this might not work, but the, the bigger challenge was we have to invest this upfront even before we can reap the benefits. It's unusual because we, we ended up, you know, from nowhere since 2017, we ended up being one of the largest recruiters from schools and colleges in the US. Uh, so that's a big shift, but once it started working, uh, it was easy to convince everybody else in my team, in my organization that this is a worthwhile investment to scale. Everybody knew that it's hard to hire. You know, the fact that you have 400 or 1,000 open positions in the U.S., very few jobs added into the mix, you know that there isn't enough available in the market to hire. So what would you go and trade for? So the only way is to build and um, and deploy it. The other big shift we had to make is to go from STEM to non-STEM, and that was a big shift. But you know, our clients are, are telling us that the technology by itself is important, but applying the technology to, to business landscapes is a bigger virtue. And for that, we need a very diverse talent pool. And that was the shift we made. We made a shift to design schools because experience is all that matters in, 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 the, in the digital age. Uh, and then we, we kind of made the switch to community colleges because we believed that the digital backbone jobs, as I call them, was a great landing spot for uh, talent we get from community colleges. And then we created this apprentice model called the digital apprentice model where you learn, earn, and work with us. Uh, so you land on a digital backbone job. You know, a backbone job could be a data operations job or a security operations job, as an example. 
Uh, however, we have a roadmap for them to do stackable degrees or stackable certificates. And um, in, in, a, in a period of two years, we want them to finish those stackable certificates. And we now have credentials attached to uh, university partnerships so that they could get an undergrad degree if somebody has the aspirations to do so. And they learn and work with us. And it's a, it's a very unique program because you would have heard, Ian, on apprentice programs in Europe for manufacturing. We've kind of replicated that to the tech and the digital space. This experiment, if we can really, really do well, it can be that template to bring talent into the digital world from community colleges, which, which potentially serve a lot of the underserved uh, sections of the society and therefore create this inclusive strategy to bridge the divide. This template could mean that it could be, it could be scaled to the 8.5 million uh, students who go to community colleges in the U.S., which is 35% of the student population in the U.S. So we're very super excited about this experiment of digital apprentice where you land on a backbone job, which is at the back end. You progressively move to the front end. And when you move to the front end, you're equipped so well uh, because uh, you're hired on learnability. So you're building the stackable certifications you could potentially be this extraordinary professional we are looking for. It's a phenomenal experiment we started on and um, super excited about the prospects and the scale at which this can uh, change uh, uh, the talent pipeline for, for, for digital skills. So we talked the human piece. So if it's human plus gig plus machines, we talked the human piece. Um, I want to talk gig economy. So the gig economy is something that I think has been both the most like overhyped and underhyped thing of, of, of recent, because obviously you see things like, you know, Lyft and Uber and, and Postmates and all of those sort of things. But the idea that a company can connect with someone anywhere in the world, find them extremely quickly uh, is so fascinating to me. For, for example, one of my buddies who's a, a startup founder, um, he was telling me yesterday that he's been using um, like his 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 developer for the past two years. Someone you know he's he's never met, uh, lives overseas, um, you know, pays them you know fair wage. He's like he's he's probably my best employee, even though he's not an employee. Um, so there's a lot of upside to things like that, but there's also a lot of downsides to things like that. And you know, the gig economy can really be something so beneficial to companies, but it can also kind of be a double-edged sword that, you know, potentially has some some negative connotations either down the line or currently. How do you view, you know, the gig economy from the company perspective? How should CIOs and technology leaders be looking at the gig economy to supplement their teams? I think you raised a very important point. If you look at how the gig economy is kind of uh, represented or it's kind of constituted. You primarily think it is about, you know, car share riding applications and um, the operations attached to it, which is uh, drivers in a gig economy, the delivery companies, the food delivery companies, the, uh, the logistics firms, which use the gig economy. So the perspective I have is first of all, it has to be looked in, para- in, in, in conjunction with uh, full-time private human capital, as I call it, uh, and the power of this is to amplify your potential in times when you need it and um, ramp up and ramp down as and when you need it. And that's what native, you know, digitally born firms do. Their ability to uh, ramp up a team and ramp down a team is super fascinating. And uh, that's what enterprises are struggling with. So by bringing this into the mix of human plus gig plus machines, uh, you're going to bring the agility um, the scale and the speed at which you could uh, um, deploy human talent. The kind of jobs I think uh, which will go into the gig economy are um, a variety of them which are needed in life cycle of uh, tech projects where you have to do a lot of heavy lifting. One of the examples I can think of is uh, testing of applications. As you rapidly add assets to your digital infrastructure, how do you make sure that you test those applications? And when you have to test those applications, you need to do a lot of heavy lifting and ramp up. Today, uh, enterprises use consulting firms like ours to scale up and scale down. Um, 
the way forward would be that um, enterprises can do it themselves. They can uh, employ the gig, uh, you know, the gig economy, or they could use uh, firms like Infosys, which can actually, you know, bring in that that agility to to that life cycle. And there are naturally sweet spots like testing of applications, operations of a specific uh, set of tasks, and testing of applications. Today, I know of companies which have literally no on-premise tester. All of what they have is a gig economy set of testers. In fact, I know a firm which actually has 600,000 virtual testers, which are supported by 100 testers, which are uh, full-time with them. And what they do, they run a platform, and this platform kind of uh, allows them to curate the work, allows teams to be virtually built, and governed by this full-time uh, employees, and then the t- and the work is uh, delivered out of uh, Eastern Europe. I actually recently read a World Economic Forum report of uh, Bangladesh, which talks about 600,000 workers in the gig economy servicing the export market or the global market, not servicing in Bangladesh, but servicing a market outside. So they're sitting in Bangladesh and they're actually catering to a tech economy in different parts of the world. I know of firms which have a large network of gig economy workers testing applications in uh, in Eastern Europe. So I would say this is going to evolve. And as it evolves, more parts of the value chain of uh, tech and digital, digital uh, life cycles will actually go into a split between dedicated human capital and, and gig economy. And uh, the dedicated human capital will focus on the creative, it will focus on the QA, it will focus on the governance, while the gig economy workers will focus on the heavy lifting needed. But you are, you are kind of employing them to ramp up and ramp down in a life cycle where you need this heavy lifting in spurts. So it's an evolving space, uh, very interesting to watch. Uh, it will change the way opportunity is democratized in the digital world, but it also gives you access to a hidden talent pool, which today you don't have access for. But of course, you know you have to work out the governance, and you have to work out um, you have to work out the regulatory frameworks in different countries to enable this. But it is it is going to uh, you know it is going to come in a pace. It, it will be a hockey stick movement on that. You know, it's not picked momentum yet, but I know some countries are thriving on it and some enterprises are thriving on leveraging it. But once it kind of takes off and once it reaches a level of maturity, my sense is it'll be a hockey stick uh, uh, adoption. Yeah, and I think um, I think one of the key components, just like you talked about upskilling for people with with technical skills, I think there needs to be a focus on upskilling, you know, gig economy workers. I mean, one of the things, you know, we know that the vast majority of small businesses or, you know, the vast vast majority of um, of people who run small businesses, the thing that's hard about doing it is the running the business part. And like, you know, some of the platforms take away, you know, some of that headache with running the gig economy. But, you know, if you're someone you know, on the ground trying to, you know, work a few different projects, how do you get found? How do you, um, you know, facilitate managing your time? How do you, you know, deal with the ebbs and flows of how work comes? And I think that, you know, part of the exciting thing is that, you know, it sounds like you maybe would be like managing, you know, one or two jobs or three jobs or something like that. But the the flexibility and the freedom for certain people is really exciting and they want to have that type of lifestyle. And for other people, it's totally not a fit and they would just rather work at a company. So I'm excited for the future of what the gig economy looks like, but I think that there needs to be some level of additional training and um, and help to those folks beyond just kind of like content. You know what I mean? Like that's not really enough. You need to have a mentor. You need to have human beings that have, you know, are on the ground that have gone through those sort of things, uh, or maybe not on the ground, maybe it's digitally, but that have gone through those same type of things. And I think that that's one of, because the gig economy is so new, we don't have enough people like 
teaching how to do those things. Uh, and I think that's super important as well. No, I think, I think you're spot on. Um, the learning opportunities today for individuals, in fact, I actually know of somebody who used to work for me and who kind of actually said, uh, you know, we hired, hired this individual from school and the guy was very fascinated to work with us. And then one fine day he said, look, I'm switching to a model where I will uh, bid, for my, bid for my work, uh, pick it up in smaller packets, do it in, in the schedules I want to, and then more importantly, train during my free time with, uh, you know, ed tech companies, which give you micro modular uh, content. So I think uh, that's the other bit which is happening on learning. Learning is becoming very micro modular. So, uh, and then it's available in a very democratized way with, you don't need to go to a university to do, to learn today. You can go to an ed tech firm and get the content needed and, and also be immersive in the learning by, uh, by registering to courses which you feel uh, will give you that kind of an experience. So I would say uh, this is an evolving space. Uh, mission critical work will not move to the gig economy as, uh, you know, in the tech space as uh, quickly as we think. In the inner life cycle of projects where you are um, doing agile distributed development, you have shorter sprints, unlike in the past, you would need heavy lifting in, in periods of time. And that's when the gig economy will kind of come in. Uh, and with micro modular content available, they could, you know, if they're self-motivated, they could um, constantly upskill themselves. In fact, my, my friends in the ed tech, ed tech space, they keep telling me that they're in the B2C world and they want to actually move to the B2B world because they believe reskilling is a much bigger opportunity for them and enterprises will directly engage with them to reskill the workforce. Vis-a-vis -vis what they do today is um, uh, micro-modular content to, for individual contributors who, who go to them, pay through their credit cards and consume this content. They think the switch is going to happen. But, uh, you know, um, we're going to have these two parallel worlds in, in learning, one for B2C and one for B2B. Today, most of the learning is B2C. I think you're going to find a parallel world of B2B being, being built. Uh, but equally important will be B2C because the gig economy is going to depend on uh, a B2C learning model. Okay, I know you are a busy guy. We got to get you out of here in the next few. Um, we'll do our lighting round in a second. But um, I, I want to know just what what's next for, um, for Infosys? What are you working on? What are you excited about going forward? Uh, and, you know, for our listeners – you know, obviously, who who don't know about the company at this point, um, maybe just share a little bit about you know some of uh, some of the things that you've been working on that that has been uh, pretty cool over the last year or so. Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, Infosys is a you know tech and a digital services company helping large enterprises on their transformational journeys. In the last uh, couple of years, we transitioned from tech services to digital services. 40% of our revenues actually today is from digital services. And what I mean by digital services are services which uh, help large enterprises to stay relevant, competing with uh, digitally native, digitally born companies. And the technologies which are leveraged to, to build this new, new age business and operating models. So 40% of our revenues has moved there and that's the transition we made. This is one big switch. The second big switch, I would say, is uh, we were historically a hub and spoke talent model we had. We had hubs back in India with large offshoring uh, uh, centers. While tech services, traditional tech services will continue to be offshored, uh, we are super excited about new age digital services, which will be consumed in closer proximity to clients at a much more agile, rapid sprints. And in context to it, we have built an agile distributed talent pool. And this agile distributed talent pool is built out of schools and colleges in our principal markets in the U.S., um, U.S. being the top one. Uh, so super excited about the transition from a hub and spoke to a distributed talent model, building these local talent hubs and redefining the future of work. Uh, redefining the future of workforce. You know, historically, we were a company which focused on STEM talent. And now we have a very diverse talent pool coming from uh, non-STEM disciplines like liberal arts and design, and uh, more importantly, from community colleges as well. So that's a big shift. The third is uh, we are evangelizing this whole company as a live enterprise, as I call it. Live enterprise is uh, a sentient real-time enterprise. Infosys wants to be itself. 
um, which is reacting to reacting real time to market dynamics. And if we want, if we become a sentient live enterprise ourselves, uh, we could potentially uh, lend that experience, lend the lend those assets, and um, lend those uh, learnings to uh, to our customers who are large enterprises who are going through the same journey. So we we are transforming ourselves so that we could uh, lend that that learning to all our all our clients. So that's the third big shift we have. So these are the three big things Infosys is um, super excited about in terms of uh, the transformation we are going through, the switch of a talent model, the switch of a service mix, which is as important for our clients. Well, we touched on human, uh, we touched on gig, and we didn't touch on machines. So we'll have to save that uh, for the future. Um, talk about RPA, talk about some of the cool stuff there. Um, so next time we'll have you back. But first, we got to do some lightning round questions. The lightning round is brought to you by our friends at Salesforce and the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. You can go to salesforce.com slash platform to learn more. Lightning round questions. Ravi, are you ready? Yep. Number one, what app are you using on your phone that's the most fun? The, the one I'm more, most excited about is uh, the one I just downloaded uh, a few days ago about um, reading books through a short um, summary. And uh, it's called Blinkist, if you've, if you've oh, heard yeah. of it. Uh, I love it. You know, I, read, I, I get a gist of a book in 15 minutes. And uh, I feel so um, so accomplished after reading it because um, uh, it would take you hours and hours to read a full book. But if you can get a gist of it and then you can apply it in 15 minutes, I find it very exciting. And then once you're curious about something you've read in that 15 minutes and you feel uh, impacted by it, then you can actually you know double down on reading the book itself. So I love Blinkist. What about your favorite food? My favorite food is, um, I would say Thai. I love Thai food. How about, do you have a favorite bagel spot in New York? You know, the, I, have, I have a Think Coffee shop right uh, below my building on the, on the, on the first floor. I, I go there for the cinnamon resin bagels, which I love. <laughs> I love it. Um, what do you do for fun? I watch uh, Bollywood movies. Bollywood movies is one of my favorites. Um, you know, I could still watch Bollywood movies in uh, in AMC and on at Times Square. So I go to the movie halls and watch these Bollywood movies and come back and have this uh, exciting debate with uh, friends on uh, what the movie is all about. I love Bollywood movies. What is your best advice for a first time CIO? For a first time CIO, I would say, you know, most CIOs across the world have got that act right on getting the financial capital for digital transformation. Uh, Very few have got it right on getting the human capital for digital transformation. So my first time advice for CIOs would be get your human capital right. Everything else will fall in place. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? The question I always want to answer is, you know, here is, here is my leadership challenge. At the vantage point I am at, I can see things what others can't see because I meet people from different industries. I meet CXOs, I meet governments, I meet academic institutions. I'm not as worried that I can see things which others in my team can't see. I'm more worried about how do I convince them to see what they're not seeing. And that's the single biggest leadership challenge you always have. What, how do you convince your teams to see what you're seeing? And they, they kind of trust in you to go through the journey with you. Well, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for joining. Um, we're, you know, it's been, I, I feel like we got through about a third of what, uh, what we wanted to get through here. Uh, so it, it was just a great time. Any final thoughts, any things to plug or things people should check out? Sure. You know, uh, I'll be excited to do two more versions, of two more chapters of this. If you think we only achieved a third of it, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, talking to me. I really learned out of this because one of the interesting aspects of doing interviews is you get time to reflect and you get time to soak on things which you're working on. 
And the more you soak on it, the more you come come out sharper the next time when you're executing on something. So sometimes I, I do these interviews to reflect on, to soak on, so that uh, whatever you're doing, you do it better. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining and, uh, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks for your time today. Bye. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.